Tim of the Fall Sports. So, who, Tim, I guess you're up, right? Uh, my name is Tim Chuckle, and I am the Assistant Activities Director for Lexington Schools. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here supporting the students and share their fall experiences at Hudson High School. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mono Field. And I'm Sophie Sabrina, and we're your senior captains. Um, so some challenges that have come through cross country are um, captain practices from getting up. It's in August and July, and we get up at like 7 a.m. and run every morning. And um, some more challenges are like getting like men the mental toughness of running and getting through like hot repeats and hills and tempo runs and like meets, which are every Saturday. Um, the most memorable thing that I that we think and that our team would also think is definitely the team bonding things we do. Um, we uh, like do a lot of team bonding things in the summer and throughout the year that are not just involved running, which is hanging out. Participating in cross country, I think has helped me grow personally and each of my fellow teammates um, it teaches me that I'm a lot more capable um, of difficult things and challenges and overcoming hardship than I originally believed. And it's really a beautiful thing to meet a challenge and, you know, be afraid and feel like, oh, shoot, I don't I don't know if I can run this race. I don't know if I can make the next mile. I don't I don't know if I can do this. And just the value of team and friendship and encouragement and and being able to look back and say, you know, I, I overcame this challenge. It gives, it gives a lot of power to um, individually to me and, and teach my teammates to think that, you know, we're, we're resilient and we can push through this. And I think cross country, you know, I can't say more than any other sport, but it seems to me just has really um, it's been super important um, in learning, yeah, my own resilience and the way that I can overcome challenges and obstacles. Um, I think cross country has taught me the importance of community and family. You know, my team, like uh, Sophie said, we do a lot of team bonding. And and the truth is, I look back in these four years, and this is like my family. You know, these are these are the girls we overcome challenges with, and these are the girls we, um, you know, we 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 cry together, and like no, seriously, we cry together and we <laughs> laugh together, and. Um, and it just builds something really special. Um, I think one of the most memorable moments I had this year as a captain, uh, we do a lot of hard workouts and, you know, maybe Sophie mentioned briefly, mile, we do some mile repeats, for example. And, you know, uh, you run a mile kind of at a super, really fast pace, you take a break, you run it again and, and over and over and over. And um, we, our coach gave us, you know, he gives us the option. Look, varsity is going to run two more. The rest of you, you can be done. But if you'd like to run, you know, if you'd like to run these, you can do it. And obviously, like, who would want to, like, run more if they didn't have to? But, no, I think just it was a it was a moment of pride as a captain to see all these girls who didn't have to do the extra work but wanted to because they, they knew they were strong enough and they wanted to, I think, you know, we, we were a team in that way. It didn't matter if you were JV or varsity, we were gonna do this together and we were gonna push through this together. And I think, you know, I, looking back, I would say really cross country has been the best part of my four years of high school. And I've been super excited to be on this team. Um, and they've meant a lot, a lot to me. So yeah, that kind of sums up. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Henry Saprina, the senior cross country captain. And this season, we I think we did great. And when we started out in the season, the beginning of the season, we didn't start out so strong. And throughout the season, we put in work, put in hours, and we trained hard. And we ended up improving greatly. And we ended up winning the conference. And uh, we made it to sectionals. And we went to sectionals and got second place to Alaska, which they won state. We, and then we went to state and we all achieved our goals that we wanted to. And I think we, we mostly improved greatly throughout the season. I'm Ethan. I'm one of the sophomore captains. We have a very young team as we have one freshman, five sophomores, and a senior on our varsity team. We have a very promising future ahead. This is something I'm very excited for as we continue to grow. I think there's a lot of success on our, on our future. Uh, my name is Owen Marnell. Uh, I'm one of the senior football captains. And uh, I think one of the bigger aspects of this season was uh, the Ingenium Leadership Program that we uh, implemented. Uh, it was put in a couple years ago by defensive coordinator, uh, Mr. Hatfield. It's definitely grown since then. Um, just starting last year, uh, we met uh, probably a couple times a week uh, to discuss, uh, individually that is, to discuss goals with, with Mr. Hatfield. Um, you know, he kind of just wanted us to, to set goals for ourselves and he kind of helped to keep us accountable uh, to just work towards those goals. Uh, it came to, you know, uh, what kind of grades we wanted, uh, we, what we wanted for our future college or not, um, what we wanted for college, um, just things like that. And then over the summer, um, all of the seniors got together. We met uh, once a month. Um, we, we actually were able to, to meet with Todd Gilbert, uh, local business owner, um, and he was able to bring in his leadership experience through uh, the business he owns and talk to us about uh, leadership in the workplace that could be applied to our team. Um, it definitely, it definitely helped. Um, I think, I think it definitely, uh, you know, made us think more, more about the, the leadership aspect, the social aspect of the team and not just winning through playing football, but winning through, um, you know, connections and stuff like that. So, um, as we kind of went on with our meetings, um, we talked about, you know, some really deep stuff. We, we went into servant leadership. We went into sponsorship. Uh, we went into, uh, really making sure, uh, the younger guys on the team, uh, they have a place as well. Um, and that, I think that really, that really changed the, the culture, uh, of the team going forward, because I think I can, I can speak for, for Evan and Jonathan here as the, as well as the rest of us that, when we were those younger guys, when we were those freshmen and sophomores, there wasn't really that uh, connection with the older kids as much. Uh, we didn't really have that leadership. Uh, you know, we were kind of just there. We, we, we learned from the coaches, not so much the players. Um, but I think that really changed this year. Uh, we, we built connections with the younger kids. Uh, we, we helped them to find their place on the team and know that just because they weren't getting playing time, that they were, they were important too. Um, and I think it was kind of the stuff like that that really – uh, is going to help the, the program going forward. Uh, and, you know, uh, the culture has probably changed forever. Uh, hi, I'm Evan Tyler. A uh, brief summary of our season was we finished five and five. Uh, some of our big wins were against River Falls at their place and then at Menominee. Uh, we ended up making the playoffs, but we lost first round because we dealt with some really unfortunate injuries. But we were a very, like, resilient team. I feel like, like we had a lot of injuries, but we always get to practice focused. Uh, we ended the season with eight all-conference selections and 12 all-state academic selections. Yeah, I'm Jonathan. We had a really successful season. We had a really strong uh, senior class of guys that uh, all worked together to really build a successful culture on our team. Um, we worked really hard. Um, some challenges we overcame. We lost our coach halfway through the season. Uh, our head coach, he had COVID, which was which was difficult. They don't really lose your head coach that much, but um, we came together as a team. We had a really good group of seniors. We had a really uh, good group of coaches, and 
we learned a lot about how to be a family and how we can take what we learned in our four years of football and then um, put that to the rest of our life. And it's a lot of fun and we're really thankful for the opportunity. Hello, my name is Darren Chuckle. Uh, my name is Lucas Biederman. Not Trevor Nava Parker. And we were the three captains on the boys soccer team this fall. This fall, our team had a record of 17, three and two. We won the Big, Rivers, the Big Rivers Conference Championship, the WIA Regional Championship, the WIA Sectional Championship. And lastly, we were runners up in division one state championship. During the season, we experienced many ups and downs some of the downs included players getting injured and sick. Although that was out of our control, we found ways to make sure we could move around these obstacles and work together to be successful. Many people stepped up to, pro to provide that necessary piece that was needed for us to move forward as a team. This year, being a captain helped me to understand that I can not only lead teammates through my actions, but also being someone that they could reach out to and use as a resource. Playing sports sp specifically at HHS has shown me how lucky we are as student athletes to have all the necessary resources to be successful and it has helped, me, helped us to grow as young men, students, and athletes. My best moments from this season have been being able to hang out and become close with the boys because then it not only has helped us on the field, but it has created friendships and bonds that will carry on long after high school and soccer. Thank you. All right, so we, we finished with, we had the best, Hudson High School boys soccer run in the history of Hudson. Finishing in the state final, we lost, but that was that was a good bonding moment for the team that I don't think many other teams have have had in the past. And overall, I think it was great. Um, along with that, we had four first team all conference, one second team all conference, and then two of our mentions. I had the opportunity to uh, attend their banquet last night, and they didn't even mention tonight that I thought the notebook that you guys watched as a team was your big bonding moment. <laughs> you said you watched the movie The Notebook together, so. <laughs> It's kind of, they failed to mention that tonight. That's, shock, that's shocking. So. Hi, I'm Maddie Gill, and I'm one of the swim and dive team captains. Um, I'm beyond proud of how our team did as a whole this year. I think overall, we had a very tight knit group of girls this year. And I'm just so proud of each and every individual on the team because many personal records as well as school and pool records were broken this season. And I think everyone had their own little victories this year. And it was really cool to watch everyone achieve those. Just to highlight a few of our achievements, we were second place in the BRC and third place at sectionals just this past weekend. And it really goes to show how dedication and hard work can pay off. There were definitely some challenges during our season. There's a point in the season where training becomes more intense with swimming and diving and things just get more difficult overall in and out of the pool as homework loads don't lighten up and we're starting to get prepared for conference and sectionals. Things definitely get more challenging, but through resiliency and perseverance, we are able to overcome that and become more close as a team. One thing that I, hi, sorry, I'm Hannah. And one thing that I learned as being captain is that we handled challenges by leaning on each other. And when things got really hard and practice was like, seemed like so repetitive, we like learned that we could support each other in every way. And one of my favorite memories was just this past weekend at sectionals, over half of our team came and supported us even if they weren't like competing. And every, after every race, we were all cheering each other on as long as we could and we were supporting each other. And that's just something that was like really stuck out to me because it's like we we cared about each other more than just what we did and how we performed. We cared about how like we reached our goals and we worked all the hard work came, paid off. Hi, I'm 
My name's Jordan and we're from the girls tennis team. Just to highlight a few things this season, um, we got second in the BRC and we finished first in our section um, to qualify for state for the second year in a row and also the second time in school history. Um, we had five out of the six eligible individual teams make it to individual state as well. Um, four first team all conference and the rest of the team second team all conference. And our um, one note about sections is that I've, all 10 of our top 10 right there made it through each round. It was, made, it was in the finals. So that was a pretty cool thing. And I'm Claire Keach. I'm also another one of the tennis captains. And we had a lot of challenges, especially at the beginning of the year. Um, competitive dur competitiveness during tryouts fueled a lot of drama and a lot of the girls felt like they weren't being treated fairly. So that was a really big challenge that we had to overcome. But after time and after we went to a few tournaments and we traveled together, um, our, us captains as long as the coaches, we were able to realize that we were all working together for a common goal. So after working through hard times and coming together after losses, it really helped our team bond together. And facing challenges like this, especially as captains, helped us grow as leaders because it forced us to step up and step outside of our comfort zone. And that's something that it's very valuable. And I'm glad we got the chance to experience and go through challenges like that, especially as a team and all together. Hi, I'm Bailey, and I'm going to try my favorite memory from the season. Uh, everybody's probably from sectionals is up there, but uh, I really like it because we initially lost to memorial in the conference we got second place to them we ended up speaking them a lot in the sections it's really cool to see everyone get really excited like we did last year because our win was kind of validated by the fact that they were in the conference last year so it's cool this year to beat them and actually have that win for us and go to team state without them there or even in this year they were in it and then also being able to be at team state and walk at madison together and do all the fun stuff and then also be at a really high level that made us all challenge and really value the point that we've all worked really hard to get to that level and I'm really proud of everything that we did this season. Hi, I'm Alina. Um, I'm a junior captain of the volleyball team. And basically, this season has been like no other for Hudson Volleyball because we've had some of the biggest like student section turnouts that like we haven't be been able to have for like the past two years because of COVID, we haven't been able to have students in the gym. And then we had, we had a lot of like challenges that we had to overcome this season. And the girls on our team showed a lot of grit and dedication to overcome those challenges. Um, this season's varsity team and program, like, as a whole, showed a lot of chemistry in the gym. So, like, it wasn't just, like, whether or not you're on varsity or JV, like, the program as a whole felt, like, as one. Uh, hi, I'm Ava Blank. Uh, I was our senior captain. Um, this season was really exciting for a lot of us, especially as seniors, because last year, uh, during COVID, we didn't get to have the student section and, you know, we were wearing masks and sometimes it was even like debated if our parents would be able to come. So being able to have a quote unquote normal year uh, where we could have those student sections and have all that support was really big for us. Um, this year, we had a team that demonstrated a lot of drive and a lot of hard work. Um, this was really evident after um, our pre-tryouts and our tryouts where we had uh, morning sessions and afternoon sessions that were about two and a half hours long uh, for two weeks. So after you get girls that go through that, you get a very hardworking team. Um, and I think that was really uh, shown during our season. You know, we started off with some losses, some that we expected and some that we definitely should have won. But, you know, the tie definitely changed after we won our home invitational tournament, uh, where we not only won all of our games, but we won all of our sets. And after that point on, we won um, all the rest of our conference games 
uh, which was really big for us. And we ended up getting fourth in the conference, which if you asked us at the beginning of the season, I don't think we would have placed ourselves there, but it was definitely nice to see the growth that occurred in our team. Uh, and we did win our uh, playoff game, 3-0. Uh, and it was really nice because it got to be a home game. And that was just a really good way for us seniors to end our season. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, my name is Nina Miller. I am the junior captain for the Hip and Girls Golf team. Um, to start off our season, we uh, were invited to many invitationals um, during the summer, and then it led to our season throughout the school year, um, which were pretty great. Um, we also have been to regionals and sectionals. Um, we placed second and fourth, which wasn't our best rounds, but that's okay. Um, over. Overall, my mom was proud, so win-win. Um, yeah, we didn't get to move on to state, um, but that's okay, we'll get them next year. So. Um, I have Maddie. Um, what's nice about golf is that we're a team, but we play as individuals, and we all work together to you know, score and everything. And all the girls from all the different schools, it's not like we're, you know, like contractors, like any basketball or it's like not like so competitive like we become friends and we're all like talking and while we're playing like we're still competing but you know we're all friends at the end of the day and it's nice because you know after the season's done we still make those friends we have those friends and overall i think we did really good and we played too well in the conference you know, next year we're gonna you know win it we had multiple all-conference players this year, and I think that we'll get it next year. All right. Well, uh, great job, everyone, with your presentations. I just had to ask, we got this photo up now i'm just curious has has this been the participation every year this is more people out for girls golf than i remember in a long time but great to see it. i'm also curious like if that's broken down by evenly split among the grades or is that mostly underclassmen do you know who can answer that okay all right Great to hear. We got good futures in all our sports. Great job, everyone. And boy, soccer, thanks for bringing home the, the hardware. That was really cool to see. And uh, we've had success in various programs over the years, but it's always good to see improvement. And um, I like to hear how many academic all-staters we have in some of these sports. So that's really important. Any other comments from any of the board members? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. So give me a second to... Yeah. 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 So many things, yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, there's no ability to do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
to cover the entrance to the next room. No. <laughs> Is this about the delegate? Yes. yes. I, it goes to a, yeah. that's a covenant yeah. newcomer. Yeah. 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 I know. So I think it's a no. cater model. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he's he's really on a main street. <laughs> Wait, you ready? Three. Well, I still got two people filling yes. people. Look out if you want to get started. Okay. <laughs> move on to the next uh, part of the agenda as uh, citizens request to speak. First up will be Jessica Johnson speaking about masks. Here? Yes, please. Into this? Yes. Okay. How much time do I have? Uh, you can have three minutes because we, I guess we have three people speaking. Thank so you. if you need, if you need three minutes, that's fine. Perfect. My name is Jessica. I live in the Hudson school district. I'm here today to advocate for my daughter, who attends one of the Hudson Elementary Schools. The school district is requiring her to wear a mask this week, the entire week. That's seven days, or that's five, that's seven hours a day, five days a week for a total of 35 hours in an apparatus that inhibits her breathing. Saying that out loud is disturbing to me and in the hopes that it may register with one of you, let me say it again, it inhibits her breathing. Let me preface my point with this. My daughter is having a fantastic school year. Every day she comes home with a smile on her face, stories to share which detail, what a wonderful day she had. She loves her teacher. She loves her friends. She loves her school. The weeks where she is forced to wear a mask are a stark contrast to this. She comes home and her body, her mood is sluggish. She complains of headaches today. One day during math, she was having a hard time understanding the material. She said that her chest started to get tight and felt like she was having difficulty breathing. My daughter was anxious and felt like she couldn't breathe. She wanted to go down to the nurse's office, but her friend next, sitting next to her had already gone down because she was feeling dizzy. So she sat there feeling miserable. Last week I was at County Market doing some grocery shopping and I came across a large container of blue mass child size. The label on the front of the mask packaging reads the following. This mask is for personal use only. This anti-dust, breathable, disposable ear loop mask has not been tested or rated and is not suggested for medical use. Made in China. This is not an uncommon packaging to say that it is not a medical device, yet here we are forcing my daughter to wear a mask to protect her from dust. The injections have now been approved for all school aged children. In the past, the discussion around masks always revolved around the fact that elementary aged children couldn't get the injection and therefore they weren't protected. Well, it's official, they may now receive the injection and therefore it's now time for the school board to reevaluate the masking policy. Let me end by saying this, not one of you love my daughter the way that I do. No one knows my daughter the way that I do. I'm telling you that forcing my daughter to wear a mask is detrimental to her well being. My daughter is my everything, and I will not sit by while you force her to wear this ineffective mask, which restricts her breathing. It's time to end the mask, the forced masking. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Richard Hess. I'm not sure what your subject matter is, but. Um... Well, you're not sure. I'll give you an update. My name is Richard Heston in Hudson now for six months. I want to give you where our city is at from our perspective. And you don't have to take notes. I have it all ready for email once I get you all up. City of Hudson, where are we at? The first 20 years of our family of four, we were in a group of the less fortunate. From the Hudson City Census report, here are some facts. Number one, we have 4, 14,103. Number two, 16.4% are 65 plus. Number three, 6.5% are 65 over with disabilities. Uh, number four, 8.9 live in poverty. So 21.8% of us are the less fortunate 
at this time in the city of Hudson. Those of us over 65 are on social security and receive an adjustment of 1% for 2021. Inflation this year is 2.8. So we need to reduce our costs by 1.8. All of our costs this last year went up over 5%. We have four organizations who plan to increase their revenue with increase our cost. Number one, school board. You have a referendum under consideration, that's gonna have an impact. You're gonna take it supposedly from we the taxpayers. So you got 22% of people that are super sensitive to any increase in cost. Uh, COVID reduced our economy downward and is forecasted to take over one year to recover by the end of 2022. Taking more monies from all of us at this time would harm the majority of us and especially the less fortunate. The golden rule says do no harm. Do we walk or do we just talk? Any questions? Yeah, we don't have an uh, interaction with the people who speak. Oh, you don't? This so. is my first time, so bear with me. Okay. okay. The rules. That's and all right. I'm sorry for being late, but I was told it's at the high school. Put in two calls today, not a call from anyone. All right. Well, thank you for your comments. Yes. So this is for you to think, plan, and think ahead. I will be back many times because I'm a challenge your referendum. I'm going to want to know your school trending for the last three or four five years. I want to know your percent levy. And I want to know your school statistics to rate it to scholastic achievement. Okay, it's called accountability. You know what that's all about. So I need to be brought up to date. I am not in favor of taking more money from taxpayers by a referendum. The state has promised to give you two thirds funding. If you're not getting it, I would like to know why. Okay, well, thank you for your comments. Your time's thank up. You. All right. Thank you. And we have one other other request to speak, but it's not from a person that's within our district. And we request that all the citizens of our district that speak, it's our, been our policy and we're gonna hold to that. So, okay. Well, I'm so- Okay. Well, thank you. You can, you're welcome to submit your comments um, by email. All of us board members read those. All right. So thank you for your time. All right. Next up is superintendent reports. So uh, I'm going to hit, uh, I guess we'll hit the K-8 music curriculum update to start off. Uh, so we have turned over to Dave for that. All right, thank you very much. So I'm gonna um, invite Lisa Skoyan and some representatives from our music team up to share a little bit about our music curriculum. And in the past, last year, we focused a lot of these presentations on the phases of the curriculum improvement process. We'll continue that focus this year so you learn more about not only the content, but that process we use to improve and review our curriculum. This year, we're gonna focus on some more specifics. Um, as an example, tonight you'll be hearing about the prioritization of the standards and some specifics on how we go through that process. It's, it's incredibly important. If we do that part right and we prioritize the standards right, everything else seems to fall into place. Music team has done some great work in phase one. I'll turn it over to Lisa to share the details. Before we get started tonight, I'd like to introduce the music teachers that will be presenting with me tonight. Lindsay Yench is a music teacher at Willow River Elementary, and she's one of our music department heads, or a department head for music. And we have Erin Mayer, who is a choir teacher at the middle school, and Rachel Nipfer, who is our orchestra teacher at the middle school. All right, now we can start the presentation. This slide shows an overview of the Hudson music program. The required courses are K-5 music three times a week and sixth grade general music. The electives include orchestra for our fourth and fifth grade students and band, choir, and orchestra for our sixth through eighth grade students. The music standards include four standards, create, perform, respond, and connect. 
and they focus on the artistic processes. The standards for music are organized by grade bands, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and 9, 12. Performance indicators provide additional ideas that support the standards. Within the standards, there are two strands, general music and performance music. This set of academic standards provides a foundational framework that identifies what students should know and be able to do in music. Last year, the K-8 music teams completed phase one of the curriculum improvement process desired results. The guiding questions for phase one are listed on the slide. Tonight, we're going to focus on an outcome for the third question, the identification of priority standards. This slide shows the criteria that we use to prioritize standards. We have used this collaborative process for all of our curricular areas for a number of years. In grade level teams, teachers identify priority standards through, through in-depth discussions using the specific selection criteria. This spreadsheet shows, one more slide please. This spreadsheet shows the process that committee members use to identify priority standards. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay, and Lindsay is going to share a few of the priority standards at the elementary level. Okay, if you could go on to the next slide, please. Um, so our music team, in the, uh, we found three of the priority standards, or three of the standards to be priority standards for our team. Um, the first one is create. And so students at Hudson Prairie created their own raps using four beat rhythm patterns. Following the composition, they added their own words and performed that for the class. At Willow River, they're showing uh, the standard through demonstrating their knowledge of half notes through centers. The students played rhythm tech-tac-toe, rhythm go fish, half note fishing, as well as two composition stations where they created short patterns and transferred them to instruments. Our next standard is perform. At Rivercrest, the students demonstrated this through playing boomwhackers. Boomwhackers reinforce music literacy by helping students learn to track and follow along with the music, as well as supporting musical concepts such as step, leap, skip, and uh, the musical alphabet. At North Hudson, third graders learned and analyzed the rhythms of hot cross buns. The students learned to play the patterns on the rhythm sticks, and then they, we, they learned the melody on the xylophone, and then put it all together and performed that with the class. Our third standard is respond. The first graders at EP Rock used rhythms you, they learned in music to help them explore In the Hall of the Mountain King by Edvard Grieg. Students took turns being the leader, and then the rest of the class clapped the patterns of the song. The third graders at Holton learned about 16th notes through the folk song Tidio. Students use body percussion to demonstrate the rhythms, and then they learn the melody to the song. Finally, the students play the instruments to represent the different rhythms within the song. And that's how we have been showing our priority standards so far this year. Now we'll move on to the middle school. All right, um, my name is Erin Mayer and I'm the middle school choir teacher. So we have um, taken time to discuss the priority standards for each of the band, choir and orchestra um, disciplines. Some of these standards overlap and some have been um, taken and decided to be a priority for a band, for example, and not for choir. Um, they're just such different animals that a lot of them do overlap because they are all performance based classes. However, some don't have instruments like choir, others like orchestra do. So we have create um, and perform, respond and connect. The one that we all uh, overwhelmingly decided was our priority standard was um, in the performance based category, which makes sense because we are a performance based um, class and discipline. So rehearse and demonstrate the ability to sing or play expressively on pitch and rhythm and with proper technique and maintaining a steady beat. Um, also perform collaboratively as part of an ensemble, demonstrating well-developed ensemble skills. We'll have a few photos here in the next few slides about some collaboration and then uh, performance opportunities for our students. 
Um, uh, this is just uh, some photos from the past couple of years or last year, I believe mostly from last year. Um, you know, the challenge of, of navigating through a pandemic and having a wind instrument um, is, is just as, as a challenge. And so these are some photos um, from some of those uh, times you can see with the kids still playing um, and then some quotes from some students, current, current middle school students that you can take a moment to read. And then um, this is some photos from the Hudson Choir Department from middle school. The top right uh, is a photo from last year. Some, this was a photo from one of the, I believe this is sixth grade choir concert that we did in the spring um, in the gym. And then a few students um, in the lower left corner were just selected this um, last last week or two weekends ago now to perform at um, the middle level all state or honor choir in Madison, Wisconsin. And then um, obviously we've got upcoming events there for a uh, busy, a busy season for the music department in general. And uh, very similar things for our orchestra as well. Um, we are thrilled to be back to our, our, our main love of live performances um, and starting our, our rockestra again, our HMS Rock Orchestra Ensemble. Um, but yeah, just a wonderful picture up at the top there. We, the choir and orchestra for eighth grade, um, performed a collaborative piece uh, for Veterans Day this Thursday. Um, and it was just a wonderful experience. Okay, any questions from board members? Rockestra? Rock Is that like trademarked or do you have? <laughs> you should trademark that. That's, that's good stuff. It's nice to see the uh, live performances coming back. It's been quite a joy so i'm glad that you guys are able to enjoy that as well and the kids are able to take it on so thanks for doing what you guys do we have a tremendous program here mr president yes and i would say i have to think that while covid was really hard for all teachers i cannot imagine doing what you do with kids in the classroom kids remote um so thank you for continuing to try to keep some sort of music program going when we weren't able to be live and in person. Um, really appreciate that because uh, I know that was a, a big lift. So thank you. Thank you very much for your reports. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're we just going in order. Um, Actually, why don't I just save the COVID operational update till the end? So I'll, why don't we go and have Aaron talk about the equity audit update? Okay. Hey. So looking forward to revisiting that equity conversation um, tonight. Um, so tonight I'll be sharing some information on um, existing work within our district. Um, and initiatives related to our student. And I really wanted to frame this presentation and, and the conversation around our student pillar, um, which is creating a supportive and inclusive learning environment that provides equitable access so all students can fully participate in their personal and academic success. So talking about things that we've been working on, and then we'll be talking about just next steps and things that we'll be focusing on in the future um, as well. Um, Again, focusing on that student pillar, um, the district mission, vision, and values really provides the direction and aspiration for all of the work that we do as a district. Um, so just kind of wanted to frame this conversation around all of those things too. Um, and if we're really living our mission and values coupled with a commitment to students, you can go to the next slide, Tim, um, then we're moving towards equity for all students. So that mission, values, and commitment to our students, plus our actions that we've been working on and will um, continue to take is how we're gonna achieve moving towards equity for all students. Um, the Wisconsin Department of Education um, defines educational equity to mean that every student has access to the resources and educational rigor they need at the right moment in time in their education 
across race, gender, ethnicity, language, ability, sexual orientation, family background, um, and income. And so we know that equity is not a standalone initiative, um, that it's really about looking at all of our practices, student and student experiences to create an environment that meets the needs of all of our students and families. Um, so the focus is really on student experience through access to high quality instruction, responsive and inclusive services to meet the needs of all students. So just to kind of revisit where we were um, when the um, equity audit presentation happened um, quite a few weeks ago now, um, looking at the recommendations and really the essential question when we're looking at these recommendations is how do we take those recommendations to strengthen our redesign structures within our district to create an environment where all students achieve, feel a sense of belonging and value the diversity within our community. So just wanted to draw your attention back to those and we'll kind of walk through um, some of those as we talk about the work that we've done so far here. So just to review um, and just kind of bring to light some of our existing practices and initiatives, we'll talk a little bit about the curriculum improvement process, our work around universal design for learning, uh, our refocus on professional learning communities um, and student connectedness, belonging, mental health and social emotional learning, um, strategic use of data for system improvement, inclusive practices and culturally responsive systems training. So if you wanna to move to the next slide, we'll start kind of talking through all of these things. Um, so the curriculum improvement process is a cycle of curricular review that includes six phases. So it's a really um, in-depth in depth process that um, teams walk through in terms of our curriculum review. Um, wanted to point out um, the language that we're using in terms of um, that, the steps that we're walking through when we're looking at curriculum resources in making sure that they're accessible um, so that ver students of varying ability and experience levels can meaningfully participate um, that materials are able to be differentiated, that they reflect a variety of ways to individualize instruction, provide content to support all of our learners within the classroom, um, making sure that our resources and materials have diverse perspectives um, and that they present in a variety of factual um, points of view and experiences. And then looking at representation, um, so looking at providing windows or seeing the experiences of others, mirrors, seeing oneself and doors, an opportunity to immerse oneself in another's lived experience, um, what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes. Um, and that materials portray people from a diverse range of cultural and ethnic backgrounds. So that's something that's been um, clearly articulated and infused into our curriculum improvement process. Sorry, we just heard from music about that they're starting right They're in phase one of the curriculum mm -hmm. review process. So which stage of that process would it be when they would be looking at music and, and like through that lens? Good question. So it's it's actually embedded in all but primarily phase three when you get into resource selection. So you'll already okay. do some of that when you're prioritizing standards and establishing essential questions and during understandings. But it's really when you get into the resource selection and the development of learning experiences that you'd really drive that home. Okay, thank you. Um, along with the curriculum improvement process and that focus on access to high quality instruction, we're doing a lot of work around universal design for learning, which is really a way of designing instruction from the beginning to remove barriers for a variety of different reasons for a variety of learners. Um, so that we're providing that um, the multiple access points for students in instruction within their classroom. Um, that's something that our rigor teamwork inclusion team has been working on for a couple of years now um, and at a point where we're starting to kind of branch that out um, more systematically um, throughout all, all of our schools. Um, professional learning communities is something that we've we've been we've had in existence for years here and this year is a really intentional focus refocus on what that looks like. Um, we're in a really great spot to refocus on that coming out of COVID where teachers had to be sort of lockstep in their planning 
so that you know kids can kind of go in and out of instruction. Where we're really focusing this year is um, with that universal design for learning framework and lens, really infusing um, student services staff in with grade level and department level um, planning so that we're planning from the get-go for a variety of, of student needs. Right, student connectedness and belonging are again, extremely important components of our equity work, um, as you heard um, during a, a different recent board report. Uh, social emotional learning allows a focus on how we're all interconnected, valuing differences and similarities, and building the skills all students need to succeed in academics and social settings. Um, as you heard in a previous board report, we're paying attention to our data um, related to student connectedness through our student engagement survey, through a variety of ways looking at different subgroups and how we, how we increase that connectedness to school. Um, the opportunity for authentic student voice within our systems was really reinforced in, in our equity audit. Um, we've had some successes with um, various student participation on committees. Um, student represent, re representatives on our mental health advisory have provided such meaningful insights into um, the experiences and the needs of adolescents. Um, and last year, um, our high school administration launched a student voice initiative to provide opportunity for conversation between groups of individuals um, and administration just regarding concerns around climate and those sorts of things. Um, and so there are plans to continue those conversations um, this year too. Trauma sensitive schools is something we've been working on for the past six or seven years within our district. Um, and it's really at its core, trauma sensitive school is a place where all students feel safe and valued. And so that's a continued focus in all of our schools. Um, in terms of student support services, we've been um, continuing to use our student data to improve supports in the following areas, really looking at our discipline practices um, related to different, different um, groups of students and how we can be more proactive in responding to behavior. Um, restorative practices is one of the ways that we're um, starting to look at that a little bit differently in terms of the purpose of discipline. Um, is to really build skills of students and, and help address needs. Um, again, looking at intervention services and special education in that same light as well. Um, and then our multi-level systems of support, um, making sure that the modifications, accommodations, or interventions ensure all students have access to the tools they need for learning and are successful within um, all of our school environments. Inclusive practices is really about strengthening systems and practices, again, to meet the needs of students within classrooms and all environments. Um, we've been paying a lot of attention through our district scorecard over the last few years about participation and representation in all of our school uh, district programs and activities. Um, our rigor teamwork inclusion team um, has done a lot of work in not only UDL and instructional strategies, but really about collective ownership um, of all of our students and how we embed that into that multi-level system of support. Um, and then culturally responsive systems training is something we did. Um, you can actually move to the next slide. This was a training we did back in 2019 um, in partnership with the Wisconsin RTI Center. Um, and it was, a, it was a big team, probably 40, 40 staff members, um, teacher leaders within schools um, and administrators and really looking at the experiences of our students, what our data is telling us and then led to some good conversation about just questions we had or further investigation. So that was canceled due to COVID, but looking forward to picking that back up um, when they're back up and running. So in terms of next steps, I think um, you know, one of the things that the equity audit showed us was that it was, it's important to look at our data the way that we have been and making sure that um, we have appropriate representation um, within all of our um, programs. Um, it reinforced that we need to increase the capacity of our system to meet the needs of learners in classrooms and in all schools. And so when we're particularly focusing on special education, for example, um, how can we make sure that we're educating students in that 
true least restrictive environment um, and talking about strategies to move away from some of our um, more exclusionary practices. Um, professional development and modeling of strengths-based language. language. We'll talk about that more specifically in an upcoming slide. Um, and then again, that continued culturally responsive um, systems professional development. So student-centered and strengths-based thinking and language was one of the things that they discussed in, in our equity audit. And it's really about the language that um, that's school staff use when we're talking about students and families um, and recognizing the need to use that strengths-based language so that we're not inadvertently lowering, lowering expectations or um, communicating a potential stereotype. Um, and so it's, it's important that our staff just have some professional development around it because it's never ill-intentioned, um, but something that we need to be paying more attention to. Um, and then just some, the district policies supporting equity, the, the policy practices supporting equity, sorry. The policy review cycle that was put into place in 2016 has allowed us from a more global sense to apply an equity lens to the work that we're doing in our policy revisions. And I think, in a, you know, a good example of that is our non-discrimination policy work um, that, we, that we've done. And I know um, in all different areas too. And then just thinking about aligning human resources that as we, as we start to dig in more to this equity work and just thinking about how we align our staff to meet the needs of our students, um, that will be important ongoing conversations. And then obviously from a funding perspective, leveraging district resources to make sure that we're funding our priority areas for our, our students. So again, just wanted to draw your attention at the end of this presentation about you know, where we started and what, what the recommendations from that equity audit were and that we're really focusing on those and paying attention um, along with the work that we've already done and reinforcing those things. Questions for me? Molly. Thank you. Um, I am really excited about the stuff that you guys have done. And I hope lots of people are. Um, one of the things I really appreciate is moving away from the special ed exclusionary practices and just from personal um, knowledge, it, this, the, how detrimental that, that can be, um, no matter where your child is on the educational spectrum. So I appreciate that. Um, one question I had was when you mentioned professional development, is that like a continuing ed type of thing? And is it for all staff? Um, how would, what does that look like? That's a great question. And it depends on what type of professional development it is and what, what is the most meaningful way to deliver that. And often that is, depending on the topic, starting with a core group and, and really having that core group understand at a higher level so that we're able to kind of embed it in all, of, all eight of our schools, um, and it needs to be an ongoing conversation, right? A one and done professional development doesn't always um, give us the, the outcome that we're looking for. Does that make sense? See, yes, it does. I was just thinking a little bit about, um, you know, people are, you know, they have the gifts of being able to um, understand communicate and be able to implement um, changes. Mm -hmm. How about a teacher who maybe that isn't their innate gift? They're an excellent teacher, but maybe it might be a little more difficult. Do we have any, do you do like a um, mentoring where it's, you know, where it's a difficult situation and you don't know what to say? Mm -hmm. The person is like, I don't know how to handle this. So do they have a mentor in that situation? They do. And Andrea can speak a little bit to this too, but all of our new staff, um, receive a mentor um, who walks through, you know, different things. And that's the kind of their go-to person if they have something challenging they need to walk through. Um, I would say that our PLC teams are also another, um, another avenue to, ex, you know, explore and have those conversations. Um, 
Our instructional coaches are another team that we've had a lot of conversations specifically at, about our equity audit and having them kind of talk through each one of these things so that they really understand it because they're also another huge go-to and a leadership team that we rely on to sort of help get information out that way. I would say a common resource is the principal in the building. So especially with our newer staff, they would often reach out to principals to, you know, throw ideas out, you know, how do I process through um, particularly difficult situations. And I think principals are a regular resource there. Mm -hmm. um, for newer teachers, I think less than five years of, of experience, they get a mentor. For um, people that are more veteran coming into the system, they get a building orientation buddy. A Bob. Um, so we try to provide different, a Bob, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, different opportunities in different ways, depending upon their needs. Well, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, I just, I, I feel so strongly that kids belong in classrooms. They belong with their peers. Um, out in the hall doesn't work. Out in the, an excluded classroom doesn't work. You're missing so much stuff. So I so appreciate what you've done. It's excellent. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions regarding the equity audit update? Maybe just a statement. I mean, <clears throat> I know it's continued work in process and you guys are, are continuing to kind of work through this. So, you know, I just appreciate continuing to kind of challenge, you know, the way that you've been doing things and your, your current thought processes. So I would say just continue to, you know, find ways to, you know, challenge the norm, right? I mean, and, and uh, find ways to continue to grow from from where we, from the from the data that we receive. So, you know, appreciate the update today, and um, you know, look forward to continued updates as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, Heather. So, um, can you talk just a little bit, Aaron, about ways that if there are parents or community members who they're really engaged in this and are wondering how, where, where do I plug in? I mean, are, are there, I know we have, we have advisory committees in some areas, mm -hmm. you know, the folks who have said, okay, we did the equity audit. Now what's the plan? And they want to be more actively involved. Are there sure. ways that, that are the best ways for them to be sharing feedback or kind of helping to inform our path as we move mm -hmm. forward? Yep. I think the advisory councils that you had mentioned are, are a great way for people to plug in. I know that um, teaching and learning has added a few um, new additional members who are very interested in this work. So that's, I think, important to be plugged into that way. I think family engagement is a really another important thing to be plugged into too. Attending our district, you know, initiatives and um, events, I think, would be a really great thing. And then just being involved in in your child's school, right? Yes, Kate. So I know there were some, you know, we looked at the recommendations and as a community kind of came up with what's important to Hudson, mm -hmm. what would you say is the biggest um, effort or change that we might see following this? I think it's a, I think it's a focus on that access to high quality instruction for all students. And so those inclusive practices um, and then the how the how we're going about teaching all students within classrooms and helping teachers understand and inc you know increase the capacity of that. Teachers understand how to do that. It's just help, you know increasing the capacity of the system. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um, well, Aaron, <clears throat> good job by the way um, in doing this and and following up. And I have a couple questions I probably should have warned you it was going to shoot them your way but i it was in the preparation for this meeting you know um over the weekend in looking at um you know we got this um, presentation powerpoint presentation in our last work session as well and you've already gotten some feedback from board members but it was around that time that i think each of us got an anonymous inquiry that was several pages long and it was obviously from someone who, you know, has a lot of fear when it comes to the equity audit, certainly didn't understand what the equity audit, the purpose of it was. But just from your standpoint, uh, do you see that this equity audit was uh, 
a, a, a waste of money? And B, do you see good things coming out of it or bad things? I mean, I think people are fearful that we're going to be changing too much too fast in this district. I think if we go back to our student pillar, I think that's where we focus and we have to be paying attention to what is the data of all students telling us and how do we think through that in order to build a better system, right? Where, where all students feel safe and valued and are learning at high levels. So I think the information was, was valuable. I think it, it, it has opened up some really great conversations in how we and how we move forward. Well, I, I, you know, we, we got some questions about, you know, how much it costs, which we've already, that is public information, but it works out to be about $7 per student in our district. And if uh, we can improve uh, the, you know, the experiences of all students um, and, and not just giving a lip service, but actually improve, I would say that that's a, money well worth spent and um I, I was just wondering when do we can we expect like a progress report and how we're doing and next steps would it be you know closer to april yeah i think that would that would make sense i would think we would have some additional data we could share in terms of what our initiatives are looking at and where we're at okay very good all right anyone else have any comments yeah heather mm -hmm. Maybe just as a follow up on that, I think, I mean, my sense is that one of the things that's hard about this is there is data that we can look at, right, around gaps. So there's kind of that quantitative data, mm -hmm. and then there's the qualitative data that's the softer side of the experiences of some of these students, um, students with special needs. So I, I, it would be nice if we could figure out a way yeah. to be talking to presenting both kinds of data as a way to kind of chart our progress on some of these issues and, and maybe bring more um, student voice to some of these reports so that we are getting a better sense from students and parents about how the changes that are being made or the trainings that are being provided or the initiatives that are being implemented, um, how, how, what kind of an impact they're having from a quantitative standpoint as a qualitative standpoint as well. So maybe if, if that's something I don't, I don't know what that might look like exactly, but that might be an interesting way to um, to, to be reporting, um, to be sharing both stories and data as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, thank you for your work and your report, Erin, and thank you. look forward to seeing the progress. Um, Nick, which one do you wanna to go to next? We'll have uh, Andrea do her staff recognition program kickoff. Okay. Cheers for peers. Um, excited about this new, <laughs> a little too enthusiastic with that, but um, excited about this opportunity because I think it's an area in the district we haven't done a great job up to this point. I don't think we've celebrated, recognized staff as consistently, as regularly as I think we should, and that we can um, really excel in this new area. So this is our new initiative. Um, so we just released it this afternoon to staff, um, and we already have 28 submissions. So I'm really excited. So November, the idea is to um, focus on gratitude and how do you, who do you nominate um, as someone who exemplifies gratitude as a coworker? Uh, and then um, we'll pick somehow, don't know yet how, but we'll pick 10 of the entries and then they'll receive a nice gift from the district and also be recognized by the school board. Working on that, um, we also asked the question of whether they want it to be kept anonymous or not. Um, in terms of the nominator and the nominee. And so we're working through some of those pieces, but instead of like getting all the nuances figured out, I wanted to leap into it a bit and start the celebration, start the recognition. Um, and just reading some of the 28 already uh, entries, awesome things. And just the level of gratitude for each other um, is really awesome to hear. And I think it's just affirming after the heck of a year we've had, right? And with COVID that I think it's a perfect opportunity to launch a new positive initiative. And I also love that it gets um, more of them in front of you guys too. So you can hear the stories. Um, they're going to be getting a, a board certificate of recognition as well, the 10 winners. And then um, hopefully it just keeps building 
And I think a really good problem would be is if we have lots of nominees all the time and we have to figure out how to um, get them more prizes. So um, I'm just excited and happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions, board members? Mr. President? Yes, Carrie. You said you don't know how uh, you'll be selecting, but it, so you don't know if it'll be a random or voted on and if it's voted on um, by whom? Right. I think I suggested cabinet having some decision making, and I don't think they're real eager to take that on. <laughs> Sounds um, like a board committee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Cause I, like, I look back at like the uh, wellness missions where we had um, the contest for like the moving images or inspiring images. And I ultimately couldn't decide because there are so many positive ones. Um, so at the same time, I know we have to have some limits around it. So whether it's a random drawing or um, if 10 particularly stand out we would build a rubric we would have some criteria um, but then there's also multiple opportunities throughout the year since it's a monthly activity that um, additional nominations can occur too so we're hopeful to you know keep hitting as many people as we can um, with the positivity so mm -hmm. Heather well I just I love that it's yes recognition and fun I think we're all reading about with the great resignation, how yes. companies are stepping up and really trying to do more to make it fun, to make people feel rewarded. And so I think this is a, a good direction for a whole lot of reasons. So thank you for the energy you're putting into this new initiative. And I love the fact that, you know, the focus is on gratitude, you know, particularly in the month of Thanksgiving. So I think that's a great place to start. And we're actually linking um, each month is going to have one of the seven mindsets of our new SEL curriculum. And so finding a way to kind of weave things together, I think is just another fun opportunity to synthesize student services, HR, all the different departments and do it together. Okay. Thank you very much for that um, program and look forward to seeing uh, what you're going to be bringing forward in future months. And then Nick gets to bring us the cheery news on COVID-19 <laughs> operational update. It's, it's cheery. It's cheery stuff. Um, a couple things on the case counts. Um, we've had kind of an uptick in cases the last couple of weeks. Um, we had, you know, quite a few over the weekend, picked up 17 cases over the weekend, um, kind of scattered throughout all the buildings. Um, we're up to about 298 cases in the district since the start of the school year. Um, so we're just trying to keep an eye on things, uh, knock on wood. They've been pretty, um, we've gotten to the point, you know, we haven't had hospitalizations or, or deaths or things along those lines. Uh, so I think that's a, a good situation. No, that 298 number, that's just students or is that students and that staff? That is students and staff. Of the 298, uh, about 30 of them, I think, are staff members. So about 10% are, are staff um, since basically the start of the school year. Um, and the vast majority of them have been, uh, vaccinated, uh, but um, you know it's been the vaccine's not going to guarantee 100. percent You're not going to get it. The goal of the vaccine is to, if you do get it, uh, you have a much milder response than than if you didn't have the vaccine. And I think it's proved pretty well for us. Um, Hudson Prairie's had quite a few cases um, as far as elementaries. You know, 41 cases this year. Um, I don't think they had 41 cases all year last year combined. So. Um, it's really, really kind of moved up. Uh, we are, uh, St. Croix County reached out for a vaccination clinic now that it's been approved uh, for five to 11 year olds. Um, we told them that they could do a vaccination clinic, more than happy to help them uh, use our space. They're going to use the high school site uh, on November 17th. And then the follow-up is uh, December 8th. Uh, it's from four to seven. So it's after the school day. The high school site works the best because we have plenty of parking. Um, kids are done early on Wednesdays um, and it's totally voluntary. So if parents want to bring their children in to have them vaccinated, great. If they don't, that's fine too. Um, so there's not going to be, uh, contrary to what's out there on social media, we are not going around and uh, into buildings and things like that. It is purely optional and it's parents have to bring their kids in. It is, however, only for five to 11 year olds, because although it's the same vaccine, it's a different dosage. Um, and so they would not be able to give uh, anybody that would be, you know, 12 or older, the vaccine at that clinic. So it November is, 17 but, and December 8th. Yep. Said? Yep. Yeah. November 17th is first dose number uh, December 8th 
is the is the second dose um, of the vaccine. Yep. Nick, are there any geographic restrictions on who can come to that vaccine nope. clinic? No, no geographic restrictions. We are hosting one in Richmond in their school district is hosting. We're trying to uh, cover the vast majority of the county. We're the two most populous areas in the county. Uh, so this is put on by St. Croix County. Other than them using our space, that's about it. And they did this clinic. We did a vaccine clinic, was it April, Tracy? I think April or May last year uh, for 12 and older. And so it um, goes pretty slick. Um, they handle everything. They handle all the nursing, the shots, the logistics, the forms. The only thing we do is we push out the information that if people want to do it, they can. If they don't want to, they can just disregard the email. So, I don't know, Tracy, if you have anything you want to add on that. I was just going to add it is St. Croix County residents. Yep. When you're talking Sorry. geographics. So I guess there is a small stipulation. Yes. Go ahead, Kerry. And is that just walk in or are. Uh, appointments required? I think uh, they do both, don't they? They're gonna, we're going to be able to send out the information at a time, uh, but people that maybe don't live in our school district would still be able to walk in. Or... The last time um, public health put together a sign up so that people who wanted to sign up ahead of time, though there were plenty of walk-ins as well. Mm -hmm. So by signing up ahead of time, I think you guarantee a spot, but there's, there's, opportunities. And I think it's changed a little bit back when they were originally given the vaccine. If you remember, everything was, you know, kept at a super cold temperature and now they've figured out that they don't have to keep it quite so cold so they can have more thought out and, and things along those lines. So, um, but really, uh, it's a public health initiative. We're more than happy to help them out with it and, uh, continuing to, to push through that. Um, couple, couple other things I wanted to talk about case percentages, We've been kind of comparing uh, area school districts and kind of where their percentages are um, since the start of the school year, like what percentage of their kids have, have tested positive um, for COVID. And, you know, it's been kind of interesting. I actually talked to Heather about this earlier today. Um, you know, it's it, when you look at districts that are mass required versus mass recommended or optional, um, they're all falling within about that four to 5% of their population going into November um, have, have tested positive for COVID. And uh, there's one outlier, which is Elk Mound. Uh, they've had almost 10% of their population test positive since November or since uh, the first day of school uh, by November 2nd. And so, um, you know, we're kind of looking at some of this data also looking at what is that? It, it really kind of matches up with what's happening in people's communities. I know Elk Mound, um, and I think that's not Dunn County. That is, is that Eau Claire or Chippewa County? Um, I'm drawing a blank. It's near out. the border of Dunn and Eau Claire. Yeah. Um, you know, they were about the time they were having big spikes. Um, I know uh, St. Croix Central had a pretty big spike at their middle school uh, about a week and a half ago where they did end up having to go virtual. Uh, they had about 15 staff members and 30 or 40 kids out, I think, uh, in a matter of a day or two, all testing positive. And so um that's a it just makes it impossible to staff buildings and i think that's the thing we're always trying to keep an eye on uh with subs and things along those lines um but really what i want to kind of bring up to discuss at the board a little bit is you know one of the things that we have talked about originally when we talked about the mass matrix or looking at masking was you know because um not all the the children in our district are eligible for a vaccine that's why we put the mass matrix into place to try to work through some of that, but now that um, the five to 11 year olds are now uh, in the, they have the EAU, does the board wanna look at, you know, at some point do we move to keeping an eye on the numbers, but maybe not doing a weekly mass matrix like we've done in the past. And this is something similar to, if you remember back in, just after spring break, we moved away from the school closure matrix um, and said, we're gonna still monitor things, but however, um, we're not going to continue to uh, post a post a matrix. And so I just thought I would ask if there's any comments, questions. You know, one of the things that I would tell you is that we do know that um, the vaccine takes three, you know, three weeks apart. So you have at least three weeks with the vaccine. And then you have two weeks after the second dose is when kids are actually would be considered, I think, uh, vaccinated, inoculated, however you want to put it. Um, so if you looked at five weeks and today is kind of roughly one of the first days, I think Friday was the first day kids could get it, but 
Um, I know that Hudson Physicians was giving the shots uh, today. Um, I'm not sure where, where else they were giving them, and I'm not sure how many they were giving. If they had a lot of a lot of people asking for them, I know St. Croix County was hoping to uh, do about 600 doses this week, not including our vaccine clinics. Um, if we did that, that five weeks from today is December 13th. Um, would be the earliest that somebody that got vaccinated today would be considered by the health officials as being technically vaccinated. So I don't know what people's thoughts are, discussion, questions. All right, Kate. I, I thought maybe we could kind of break it apart. I'm looking at the high school. I kind of, I made a graph because I was trying to see in my head where numbers are going. Mm -hmm. And so they're consistently going down. I know there was an uptick, but it's gone from like high to extreme, way, way, way lower, especially in the high school. And those kids are, have the ability to be vaccinated. Um, so I wanted to make a motion to end the mass matrix at the high school initially, and then to end the ma mask matrix on the 13th for the rest of the kids who have that ability to be vaccinated. Okay. Other thoughts? Yeah, this is more of a discussion because there's no motions that could be made during superintendent reports. Okay. So, well, but go ahead. Well, I, I I think um if we're gonna if if we were to go with this, um to me I would think that we would want to give it a cup. I mean, not every parent who wanted their kids vaccinated was gonna be able to get them an appointment on the first day that Hudson Physicians was giving vaccinations. So the first kids who got appointments mm -hmm. would be considered vaccinated on December, whatever that is, mm -hmm. 13th or whatever. And I think it would, if we go that if we go that route, I think it would be reasonable to think and Let's let's assume that we need to give a week or so for everyone to get in and get mm -hmm. those first shots. I mean, I think that to not necessarily go from the day of the first yep. vaccination, oh, yeah. but right. to, to think about it that way, maybe. Anyone else? What how do people feel about uh, you know scheduling some kind of horizon for uh, sunsetting the mask mm -hmm. matrix? You know, personally, I'm okay with it. I, I think, like with anything we've seen with this uh, pandemic, and you just never know what's going to come two, three, four months down the road. So I think just having something there has been helpful for us as a guide. And and um, you know, I, I'm I'm for for progressing forward with it, but just making sure that you know we recognize that we have no idea where this thing's going to go. So. We just need to make sure that we're as a board communicating regularly like we do. And, you know, should we see something turn back the other way that we're open to uh, the steps that we need to take in order to make sure we're, you know, keeping our, our kids and staff safe. Bruce or Bob. I'd agree with Bruce and uh, what we've others have said so far. Uh, I think uh, some people have said, well, can you make adjustments to the numbers in the schools? And, and that just seems like, so while still transparent, more honest is just looking at it and, and saying we haven't seen you know big jumps in the high school. It's been six six weeks or without a mask are required. Um, I, I think we I think people would like to see it kind of come to an end. And of course, watch the numbers. You mentioned about St. Croix Central. That's frightening. And again, if we don't have staff healthy, we're gonna mm -hmm. to think that we might have to go virtual again is not something I want to get to. So obviously keep an eye on it, but I think the community and, and people want to see us kind of put an end to the matrix. Mm -hmm. um, I would be in, in favor of, you know, the elementary after Christmas break mm -hmm. or whatever we were discussing, as long as there's a, um, you know, enough couple of weeks for people to get their mm -hmm. kids vaccinated. I think that's reasonable. Well, and, and just thinking out loud, um, I can see where some people might question the wisdom of if you're going to ask uh, and end, end the mask tracking, why would you do it right when people just get back from the holiday? Like, why wouldn't you give it to, I mean, so something to think about, like, do you, instead of saying January one, do we say, yep, we're going to continue to monitor for that week or two after the holidays and assuming we don't see any, I mean, just, I don't know, something to think about. I, I think what's challenging is, I think I just read that the CDC is saying that 
an outbreak is three and a half times more likely in a school that doesn't have masks as, than a school that does. And it's kind of like, okay, but what's, what's the end? You know, is the end a half percent likely that a school would have a mandate, which means would have an outbreak, which means that if you wear masks, if you don't wear masks, then you're up to one, one and a half. Per, you know, I mean, it's hard to, to kind of what, what's the, I, I think you're right. Weighing against other things that we do every day that, that, that we know there's some risk. I mean, so that, that's what's, what's hard is three and a half sounds like a really big number, but three but and a half of what? Of what? I mean, right. so it might be yeah. that schools with masks have a 1% chance of having an outbreak and schools with, without masks have a three and a half percent chance of an outbreak. And, and I think that's where you have to be careful, at least when looking at the data and reading some of the stuff is really making sure you're putting context in some right. of these things right. and, and what we're looking at. Um, you know, I think as we, um, you know, the, why do it either at winter break or before, you know, I think, um, the real driver on this is not necessarily people gathering or things like that. It would be the eligibility of vaccination. And we do know that people, not everybody's going to get the vaccine. We know in St. Croix County, only 60, 64%, uh, or no, not even that. I think in our school district, 64% of all people have gotten the vaccine at this point, um, and, you know, but it's also if there's going to be a group of folks that are never going to get the vaccine, are we going to stay in mass forever because there's a group of folks that are never going to get the vaccine? I don't know how um, reasonable that seems. And, you know, I think, um, you know, it could be as simple as saying, OK, hey, at the uh, at the elementaries, you're going to keep the mass matrix in place, you know, through, you know, basically um, if you if you say a week, if you give people a week you know, that basically is the 20th of December. So then you might as well just say, Hey, when we come back from winter break, we won't have a mass matrix any longer for the elementaries. If you feel comfortable, we can say, you know, at the secondary level we've had, you know, it's, it's actually been knock on wood, you know, pretty, pretty good. Um, you know, we can say we can sunset it early because they do have the eligibility of, and they have had the opportunity to get, to get vaccines. And that could be a big reason why, we're seeing the lower numbers, especially at the high school and, and at the middle school for the most part. I mean, it's uh, something we can do. It wasn't an action item tonight, but it's really just trying to gauge the interest. And, um, you know, if there's if there's interest in this, then really it's it's going to be um, an opportunity for us to, to start having a conversation and saying, what does that what does that look like? How do we wind it down? Go ahead. Molly. Um, I just had a couple comments, questions. Um, I would like to know what are the numbers at the high school over time? Where yeah. are we at with that? That's the first. Question. So, so last, last week we had a total of five cases the week before nine cases the week before that six cases, four cases but the week before that um, 10. I mean, our high was back in September when we hit 21 cases in a week. So um, I think Bob said, I mean, I, I, we haven't been in mass since the week of the first of October. So it's been five or six weeks, at the high school, um, you know, it doesn't mean we couldn't have a week where we have more cases. I mean, but I think that's the, the, one of the things that I think I had a conversation even today with Heather is what is going to be our measure long-term in the future, because there's a strong possibility we could be considered a high transmission state based on the CDC standards for several years to come, just because uh, it doesn't take very many cases to be considered a high transmission rate. Um, and so what, what does that, what does that look like? And, you know, having the threshold of everybody in our buildings that wants a vaccination uh, is eligible, I think is about as clear of a threshold as um, we could have, because after that, I'm not sure really what, what the big difference maker, it could come years before we start to see a lower amount of COVID. I don't know. I, I agree. I think we just have, we're going to have this problem mm -hmm. it's just going to be ongoing and we'll have to deal with it and um, as needed. And I agree with Bruce that you know, you always have to have that in your back pocket. If there is an outbreak, you know, of course, you're going to have to start wearing masks again. Um, and I would support uh, what Kate is saying, I would support that. And also that probably waiting till Christmas break on kids to give them a chance. And also, I, I would think, you know, the way our world works when my kids were in school is a lot of stuff happens over Christmas break that isn't really party related. It's getting stuff done. That you have to get done. So perhaps people will do that. The other comment is, is there a way to do a vaccine booster clinic? Because I think, you know, um, 
I know people have gone in who qualify and have had a regular doctor's appointment and they have said, no, you don't qualify. Well, you do qualify. And meanwhile, you can go to Walgreens. So it's not as a seamless as a process. And just from a, my personal perspective, my mother-in-law just had breakthrough COVID and we didn't think she was going to survive. They said she'll not make it through the day. So that's again, why we wear a mask. And I'm so sick of it. I'm sick of talking about it. I'm sick of wearing it. I got a zit, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm too old to have that. Um, but the reason I wear it is because people I love uh, are in danger. And I would be very sad if, if someone old that I care about who is not on their way out and who is still worthwhile should um, leave us before their time. So of course, yes, we can't do this forever, but I think we have to be really careful mm -hmm. about what we do. So I support you, Kate. And <laughs> high five. Well, so that's what I have to say. So one of the things I could do is, you know, from what I'm hearing you say is uh, maybe at the September or the November 22nd meeting, I think that's coming up in two weeks. Um, I could put an, we, you know, we could put an action item on the agenda that would basically say, um, at that point, if the board accepts it, the high school, middle school would go kind of mass recommended optional, unless we see something that just kind of blows us out of the water, kind of similar to what we um, did at the end of last year. And then starting, basically, we come back from winter break, the elementaries will have had enough time to be uh, vaccinated, uh, and they would go to mass recommended slash optional at that point. Um, but that still gets us, you know, another week or two. Of, of data before we uh, head in uh, to uh, to that decision, and and I think if things continue to trend in this direction, I think we'll be we'll be in a pretty good spot. And um, you know, and again, we don't want to we don't want to throw caution to wind, but we're trying to find we're trying to find somewhat of a balance. Um, I think going mass recommended is not uh, versus mandatory is not a um, we're not going to be like the first district that's ever done that. So I mean, it's not like we're we're the test case. I remember, you know, last year when we were talking about going to school and everybody thought we should be virtual, there was a lot of pressure then. Uh, at this point, I don't think it's quite the quite the same thing. So um, I think if if that's something that people are comfortable with, I can kind of draw that up. And then we would probably also at that time probably start to change our communication a little bit. If you remember at the end of last year, instead of sending the building wide letters, we started to send classroom letters. Um, but we still keep the totals. We can still keep the totals on the website, keep those updated every day. Uh, so people have access to that, but maybe we would also probably recommend um, at the elementaries, once we come back from winter break, that we go to classroom letters, the way we handle strep throat, influenza, other communicable diseases in classrooms versus building wide letters, um, unless there's unless there's a need, but we'll start to kind of adjust some of our, our communication strategies as we as we move forward. When does winter break start? Um, I believe it's the 23rd. Okay. The 20, it's a Thursday, I believe. The calendar chief sitting next to you, do you happen to know? Uh, right <laughs> 22nd? Okay. Oh, okay. And Nick, as far as um, like events you know spring break or whatever you know in the past that we've really not, not seen you know with the sports and people in the gym and and big crowds we haven't really seen any outbreaks in our district that could be tied directly to well i mean it just it, it really depends on what you what you determine as an outbreak i mean the cdc is basically more than one case in any one environment they consider that an outbreak i mean so i mean now, the average person, I would say, would probably say that's probably not an outbreak if you happen to have two cases out of 150 people. Yeah. Um, so it's it's kind of in the eye of the beholder. Uh, but no, we have not seen, you know, we didn't come back from spring break and see a huge spike. Um, we had homecoming this year, unmasked homecoming, 900 kids in the gym or in the commons area dancing, having a good time. We didn't see a huge spike after that. I think... Um, you know, we're, we'll continue to monitor. I think right now, the reason we're seeing more cases at the elementary level than, than anything is because it's the last group that's not vaccinated. Um, not that everybody's vaccinated at the secondary level, but there are more people vaccinated. And we had a lot more cases at the secondary level last year. So if you look at kind of the natural immunity piece, plus the vaccinated immunity piece, um, we're starting to get to a pretty high level um, when you start to talk about the older kids. So 
but um, it doesn't mean it can't happen and I don't want to jinx us, but you know, for the most part um, it's, you know, we've been, we've been pretty good with large events. All right. Well, I will, I will have that ready to go uh, for the 22nd and um, we'll get that. We'll get that going. So. All right. Moving on then to action items. First up is the consent agenda items with the expenditures pursuant to the language in your agenda. Mr. President, I move approval of the consent items and that the chief financial and operations officer be authorized to pay bills in the amount of $1,336,019.12. Second. Right, motion by Heather, second by Kerry. Calls for a voice for all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay, the ayes have it. Mr. President. Yes. If I may, just real briefly, I just want to announce that um, Sarah Jamison, you just approved her as my new assistant director of HR. So she's been with the district as counselor at the high school for 22 years and wants a new challenge and I'm ready to have her. So um, Holly Butler went to be the HR director in Richmond. Super happy for her. Um, but I'm also excited for the new opportunity for Sarah. So just wanted to mention that briefly. I know we usually have to stop the consent agenda for changes in HR. So that's that's kind of a you know regular thing. So. Yeah, it happens so often. So. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right. Okay. Um, next up, a serious agenda item is to select the WASB delegate and alternate delegate for state convention. And uh, Tim, did you get the short sticks ready? <laughs> short straws? No? Um, okay. So this is something that uh, every year we it's do. sought after. Uh, luckily, I mean, we didn't do it really much last year. Bob, what was the issue? Was it uh, virtually done or? Bob did it virtually. No. You did it? I was in person. Rob was down at the. No, yeah, but in person would have been from two years ago. Yeah, that was. Okay, yeah. And then. Uh, I mean, you did it. That's true. Yeah. 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 Nice. So just <laughs> first of all, first of all, all well, I mean, seven we, of us are uh, registered for yes, the state. Yes, all convention. seven attending. So. so but um, sticking with tradition. <laughs> well, okay. well, I don't know, Heather, have you ever done it? Yes. Will you delegate? Okay. Yeah. So it, has anybody not done it? Oh, no, that's part of the mystery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it basically, okay, first of all, there's so every district is encouraged to put forward resolutions. Uh, in my nine years, I think we've put forward one or two. One of them would have been the the penny tax that we have, you know, got Shannon Zimmerman to be a champion of that now. And so uh, we've done that. River Falls School District, I think they do like three or four a year or something. But um, so you can do these, you know, they're kind of policy issues. There's a whole committee that screens these, but our deadline for submitting one is already passed for this year. So those are in the process of being screened because you can imagine with 400 school districts, there's going to be school boards that have similar ideas. You know, we should be doing X and we need to push the legislature to do Y. Um, those are basically what the resolutions are. They're, they're non-binding policy issues, but still um, there's been examples of how they've actually made, gone into law and they've made a change in policy in the state. So, um, we get, I don't know, how many is it, Nick? It's, I don't know. It can be upwards of a hundred of those resolutions, right? Yeah, I think they, they kind of whittle them down even prior to the Delhi Assembly. So then essentially uh, it's the first day, uh, the first day of the convention. Um, Bob chime in at any point because you're the most recent one. All the delegates across the school districts, they get into a room, they go up, they present the um, uh resolution which is basically they're trying to create the legislative platform for wasb and uh they base uh, i think it's a voice vote or is it an email vote or something it's, they've got some little button thing, oh, a little button thing. yeah it's all high tech and, and honestly you you're you're given all the all the the um the items first before you even go and we kind of decide as a board what we support and what we don't so it's not like you have to 
d- decide for yourself or, or we usually do it at the um i think it's ready at the december work session yeah. um yeah usually December yeah. work session or jan yeah. January or the january meeting. action meeting the, but the um, whole part isn't intimidating yeah. that the good thing that i would tell molly and kate is that it's <laughs> i'm not going to try and sound as excited as and uh, andrea's on her cheers for peers but um it's I'm, i can't be that <laughs> Andrea, I just can't. Um, but uh, <laughs> but the, the really interesting thing that I took from it is, is you're seeing all these different delegates from different school districts, different areas of states, small rural schools, big urban schools. Uh, they all have their unique things that they're pushing for. And you really get talking to these people and you really get a window into the struggles of other districts or what they think is important that you might just be shaking your head saying I can't believe that, that, you know, but it's, it's very, it's very interesting to see how, how this state and all the districts work for their own selves and, and, you know, sometimes come together for the good of all. So yeah, some of the resolutions, you can definitely see where they're coming from and it ends up hitting rural versus urban um, sometimes uh, in, you know, upstate from downstate and all that, but um, Nick and the, and the administrative team go through those resolutions and some of them, there are positions that um, we wouldn't necessarily support. So, and some of them get heated, the and they actually come. They bring uh, uh, friendly amendments or non-friendly amendments, and try and change it to get something <laughs> oh, to go. Yeah. It's it, it, yeah, that's one job I would not want to be as the parliamentarian for the delegate <laughs> assembly. That is not a fun job. But um, anyway, so with all that uh, description, um, the, historically, it's been. Uh, a job for somebody who is uh, relatively new to the board. So we've got two new members. And Terry's so that's why. Right. Have you? Oh. I would want to take that So, I mean, it, and in the, historically, and uh, anyone who's wanted it has generally uh, been uh, <laughs> unanimously voted. So, <laughs> and so. All okay, right. very good. All right. All right. So to make this official, do we have an do we have a nomination then? Is there a second? All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. We have elected Kate Garza as our delegate. Um, and we need an alternate. So uh, I will nominate Molly as our alternate then. I second. All right. All those in favor say aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. We have our delegate and our alternate. Um, and hopefully, you know, we don't have to use the alternate thing because that would mean that some for some reason, but strange things have happened. So anyway, we um, were set there. Facility committee update and options for community survey. Yep. And so um, the, the link on here is just the link to the uh, most recent task force meeting, but a uh, couple things I uh, just want to touch on. Did I think all of you were at the meeting on um, last Monday night, and we have another meeting coming up, kind of our final meeting Monday night. But we're getting very close to to getting to the point where we're ready to survey the community and find out what their feedback is and what their thoughts are. Um, the originally we sent uh, uh, they architects got feedback from the committee on you know their thoughts on different things. They came to they came to the committee, I think, a meeting or two ago with uh, five different options. Uh, and uh, two of the options had us maintaining all of our current facilities uh, at some level. And three of the options had us reducing the number of, of elementaries that we currently have in the Hudson School District. Um, and then, so we went through some of those conversations again last Monday night. And then at the end of the meeting, the architects had... Uh, people vote on on where they were kind of sitting so we could get kind of an idea of, you know, are there any options that we really need to kind of just not head down towards that path? Or are there any things that people are, are supporting? Um, and just remind you, these were votes that were done with the community member, uh, community members voting, not the uh, board members voting or, or uh, district administrators uh, voting. And so the, you know, the big piece that, that came out is there were two options that kind of rose um, rose to the top um, were option uh, preferred options uh, were option B, which is to invest in all of the uh, 
current elementary is obviously not Rivercrest, uh, but um, if you get down to option B, um, and uh, we need to probably change the wording because it, it says on their neighborhood schools, but as we've kind of dug into it more, we really technically don't have neighborhood schools when you consider the amount of students that we have that actually are eligible for busing. Uh, Heather asked me that question uh, earlier and was able to get the information on that. So we'll, I'll talk to that in a minute. But option B was basically to invest in our existing facilities, not change the number of facilities we have. Um, and and look at that and then option e was the other one which was to consolidate our facilities which was actually uh to eliminate um ep rock uh willow river holton and north hudson and then to build two brand new elementaries on the north hudson site and on the ep rock site uh that would handle the population for those uh for those four buildings um can you, you go to page 38 Tim? that is Kind of the option summary yep so all of these documents can be found on the on the district's website uh we make sure that they're on there after all of our meetings um and really the the way the way it kind of the preferred options voted out um option b uh the preferred option was for eight of the members uh option e 12 of the members was the preferred option and then uh option c had one one vote as far as the least preferred options so that was one of the other exercises uh it was option a had the least uh preferred uh, uh was the least preferred option and that was basically maintaining all of our buildings but just sticking um uh, maintenance money into those buildings but really uh i think the biggest thing is you'd stick about 55 on here about 55 million dollars into the elementaries but when you walk into those buildings, they really wouldn't look any different. And so I think the concern the committee had was um, people would say we stuck all this money into the elementaries and we didn't really get anything when we did get stuff. It just it's all of the mechanicals and the HVAC and things like that. And that's what costs so much. Um, the uh, second preferred option. You know, we kind of did some some different questions was basically E and E and B. So really. The, the two options that have stood out as to where the committee's at right now and what we're going to meet one more time to talk about is, is primarily B and E. And one of the other things we have to ask the committee is what to do with the middle school, because the middle school is kind of a standalone uh, option that could be either a, a secondary question. You know, we can run two questions if we were to run an F uh, referendum or uh, it could be tied all together. Um, and I think the thing that's important to remember about the middle school is, although yes, we did some work on the middle school back in 2016 when we passed the referendum, it was uh, it was to add on to the middle school um, for some of our increased enrollment that we've had there. It was not to remodel the whole middle school uh, and bring it up to where it needs to go. So I think, you know, that's just something to kind of, uh, kind of keep in mind and priority one and twos when we think about priority one and twos they're primarily health and safety kind of items their mechanical systems their roof systems their um you know all all the just kind of the things that you have to you have to do to buildings you know a lot of times people say well why didn't you just do as you you know do this as you went and you know the West, the way wisconsin fund schools is it's it's almost impossible to do large-scale maintenance in your general operating budget it just doesn't work it just doesn't work that way you know i would equate it to most people can do you know carpet replacement and painting in their house and and you know upgrades here and there but if all of a sudden the roof goes out and uh the furnace goes out at the same time um those are starting to become really big ticket items and they might you know need a home equity line of credit to accomplish uh, or a kitchen remodel or something along those lines. So it's kind of the same type of thing where typically the, the items that are in that we're talking about are, are large ticket items that are almost impossible to do as you go. Um, we look at the different costs between these options. Um, you know, between B and E, B is a $101 million option and E is an $89 million option. Now, if you start to break some of those apart, you pull the middle school out, you can pull about 19 million out of each of those. Um, and you look at what is just kind of the elementary cost option. I think the other thing that's important to note, and we've talked about this a little bit, is the board does have some fund balance um, and could have you know anywhere from eight to $10 million worth of fund balance to apply to the projects in order to get the overall cost or you know tax uh, impact down um, as, we, as we look at look at some of those things. So 
you know, there's a variety of different things going on, but our goal is to, um, you know, uh, with the committee is get them to, you know, we feel like they've kind of dialed in on B and E want to get some feedback from the board tonight. Cause I know you guys have been at the committee meetings, uh, in your thoughts. And some people say, well, are we rushing? Are we not rushing? A lot of the informational pieces with the community goes and happens once the board makes a decision on what they want to move forward with. If you remember when we did the secondary space uh, referendum, I think we had 40 or 50 meetings uh, between the January resolution and the April referendum, where I went and spoke to different groups and community members and things like that. And board members spoke and we had community meetings and things along those lines. So that, that all still happens. Um, the biggest difference between this and what we did with secondary space is um, Instead of doing a process steward team, we chose to do the facility committee route and um, and get some feedback. Get some feedback that way. Um, we did have our finance uh, person Brian Brewer from Baird was in at the meeting at the last meeting. Um, I think it's important to note that um, he talked about not only what our options are moving forward, but also what we've done in the past. And we have a history of under promising and over delivering. And so, for example. The mantra when we passed the high school referendum was 90 cents for 90 million. Uh, it was going to cost 90 cents on the mill rate to borrow $90 million. And we did that you know, calculations based on very conservative estimates. The similar type of estimates we're calculating for this referendum. But however, this year, if you look at our current mill rate moving forward or for this year, it's actually going to cost about 45 cents to make three payments on that. And that, that there's two reasons for that. One, we were able to borrow money at a better rate than what we originally thought we could borrow. And so it was cheaper for us to borrow the money. And so we have less repayment. And two, our property valuations have gone up. And so sometimes people will say, well, see, Nick, you really haven't over delivered because uh, my property value has gone up. So I'm paying more. Well, yes, yes, you are. But in the last four years, uh, people's property value would have to have gone up 100% in value in order for it, people to have to pay what we told them they were going to have to pay back uh, four years ago. I mean, so, and to the best of my knowledge, we haven't had any of that type of growth. We've had a lot of property value growth, don't get me wrong, um, but not 100% growth. So somebody that had a house that was worth $200,000 back in 2016 would have to be worth now $400,000 today. Not saying it couldn't happen or somebody couldn't find an anomaly, but for the most part, we have been able to um, deliver at a lesser amount, actual real dollars out of people's pocket uh, than what we said we were going to do when we pitched this referendum uh, four years ago. And so I guess it's almost five years ago now. Um, and so uh, I think that's important. So as we look at the calculations related to what it would cost the district um, moving forward, we're using, like I said, the same type of calculations. Um, and we'll continue to look at that. A lot of the finance pieces and whether or not you want to go to referendum or not go to referendum or how you want to handle it, I think is the bigger discussion the board will have once we find out what's the community willing to support. Um, and that's kind of a piece that um, is kind of our next step. Question. Well, and the next step being the survey, which we're holding pending this last meeting of Yep. The committee. Yep. So we're going to get final feedback from the committee and we're working on kind of getting the draft. A lot of the survey questions are similar to the survey questions we asked during the secondary space referendum, tax tolerance questions, um, demographic questions, things along those lines. Um, so our goal is to get the survey down to under under 12 pages and it's not 12 pages with questions because there's pictures and there's all kinds of other stuff in there, but it's to make it actually even smaller than we had uh, for the secondary space survey. But our goal would be that the survey would would hit mailboxes on December 1st, pending you know what the committee decides next Monday. Uh, December 1st, it would be out for two weeks. Uh, and that's typically what we've done for surveys. Um, and then at that point, then the board would be getting the initial results from the surveys on their December 20th meeting. I think that's right, that's a Monday. Um, and you can start to get some feedback as to what the community is thinking. Um, and that will give us some time to decide. The board might say, you know what, we got to go back to the drawing board, or hey, it looks like we're moving in a reasonably good, uh, you know, direction. Uh, you know, what do you want to do? Um, and then, you know, in January, the board again can have some additional meetings about it, uh, and either they can say, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna slow things down a little bit, or we're gonna keep on the same path. And you guys would have to make a motion uh, for a resolution no later, I think, than the twenty fifth. Is that right, Tim? Twenty fourth, twenty fifth of January. 
of January if you wanted to go to referendum in April. Now, again, that's that's a big if. And that's what we try to tell people. There's a lot of different moving pieces here. Um, but as we're continually get the feedback, um, one of the big differences between E and B is there's a tremendous amount of operational savings on an annual basis. So um, B, because you would be making the buildings more energy efficient, but you're not doing anything with staffing, you're gonna save probably around $100,000 a year in just energy efficiencies with new efficient buildings uh, through utilities. E, because you're really reducing you know, the number of sites you have and you're able to operate, operate a lot more efficiently, um, we'd be looking at a savings anywhere from one and a half to just over $2 million annually in operational savings um, out of our general fund uh, that, that uh, because we would be in a, a little bit more efficient setup with four elementaries versus six elementaries as we said. So questions, comments? Heather? Nick, can you remind us if we wanna go back and look at those priority one and two, I mean, so that, that, that kind of option, that's the mm -hmm. bare bones, I mean, I get the sense that at least priority one is almost the like, we can't not do this if we're going to operate safe yep. schools. But where, if we want to be reminded about that, is that in the first it meeting should be, packet? I, I think we that? have, I, yeah, it'll be in the first meeting packet. We have those in there. Um, and, and really the, the bottom line is we have to do something. So people would say, well, let's not do anything. Well, uh, that's, that, that doesn't work long-term. You're going to have to do something. So you got to decide as a board, are you going to do something as in investing into all of the buildings that we currently have, or are we going to try to reduce the number of buildings that we have? And so that's why there's this, this kind of this impetus for change, because once we start investing large amounts of dollars into, into buildings, we'd prefer to hold on them for a long period of time so that we obviously you know, get use out of that money. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the priority ones and twos, those are things like boiler systems that need to be redone, HVAC systems. Those are roofs that have to be repaired. I mean, so even if we were to go to a referendum in April and it doesn't pass, we would have to go back again and try to figure out how to get it passed because we have we have things we have to do. We, Thank you. We, I guess that was my question. I mean, it's the, 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 there's stuff that we have to do that we can't do without a referendum. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mr. President. Bruce. You know, I... I um, I would like to just go back and make sure we look at the process that we followed last time uh, only from the perspective of the timing, you know, uh, and, and um, ensure that we're engaging all the community, um, you know, through different forums and conversations. Um, it'd be a pretty short window to, to do that, get the feedback. Um, you know, and I, I think there's a, a, there's some differences here and, uh, you know, time will tell, right, um, you know, what the outcome will be. But I think ultimately, the fact that, you know, money's still very inexpensive to borrow, it's probably a good thing for us to be certainly having this conversation, trying to figure out a solution to, to get a path where, um, you know, we can manage some of the costs that we're going to be incurring. Um, and I think looking at a couple of different alternatives where we may be taking uh, some schools out, uh, is again a, a prudent thing for us to do as a district um, and as a board to be at least exploring, and we do that through, um, you know, the good the good uh, feedback that we get in the surveys. So, you know, I, I think as long as we, you know, are prepared for the the actions that we need to take from the survey, um, seems to me like generally speaking, they're pretty good uh, litmus tests in terms of whether or not we could even get a referendum passed. Yep. So. Um, you know, support, supportive of, uh, you know, continuing to move the process forward. I think it's it's something we have to do um, to, to manage the, the appropriate costs in the districts and, and, and the district and those costs that are continuing to come at us. Um, again, I just really wanna make sure we're getting the full voice from all of the community uh, in that process. And the task force is a part of that, uh, but yet there's still a lot of other individuals that I think we wanna make sure we're engaging finding ways to educate, you know, particularly about where, you know, some of even the financing is right, is right now. And then, you know, uh, again, making sure that everyone is understanding why we're doing the things that we need to do. Um, you know, it's, it's just, uh, I feel our responsibility as a board is to really make sure that we're engaging the full community in that regard. So, um, 
you know, we're taking good steps right now. I just, um, making sure that we're, you know, creating those opportunities to have those forums where we're getting, uh, the full voice from all of the, the different stakeholders in our community. Thanks. Okay. Other people's comments. I think the, uh, the presentation by Brian um, from Baird mm -hmm. was very compelling and uh, probably the most important 10 minutes of all five meetings that we've had so far in, you know, being able to say that, look, we have done this before and projecting what the cost of these things are. They do it extremely conservative. And the last time they did it by, we're really on year six from 2016, but by that time, we're already at roughly half the mill rate impact that we said we were gonna be. And if we just filled in that 44 cents or 45 cents, whatever, um, it's down uh, from the original 90, we told voters back in 2016, that we could have uh, certainly uh, e could be paid for. I don't know about uh, B. B might uh, put us over that 90 cents. But um, I think it's to follow up on Bruce's point. I think uh, the task force was important to get things off the ground. Certainly the survey is going to be another very important piece and then see what kind of talk it generates. But um, this is one we just don't have it's not as exciting to talk about maintenance needs and so forth than it is when you have a high school where you have only 139 square feet per student and you know trying to give people had very good visuals of how packed like sardines the kids were at the high school and so there was a, a definite need but here people go in our schools and because of the great job that our janitor our maintenance people do and so forth you don't see the obvious glaring, oh my gosh, um, you know, we got to replace the school type of thing. But um, we saw it in the secondary space of the high school um, when that one architect, I can't remember which one did the facility needs and came up with a number that was 36 to $40 million just in maintenance that needed to be done at the high school. Now we ended up pushing it off and pushing it off and, uh, if we hadn't have remodeled the high school, we would have incurred those costs. But by the time that we were addressing them, they were going to be double what they were estimated to be when they first did the survey. And with the rates of construction inflation being eight to 10%, and right now with the cost of money being so extremely low, we'd be doing a disservice to our constituents if we didn't bring this up in currently right now. I think waiting is detrimental to our taxpayers if we wait on this. Yeah, I think that's the, the big challenge. I mean, construction inflation is anywhere from four to 7% up to 10%. And right now we can borrow money, they believe for less than two, um, you know, and, and that's, that's going to be our big challenge. Um, you know, we really wanted to start down this path, this conversation back in 2019, when the board originally approved World Architects as the um, architects to help us through this process. And then COVID came and kind of delayed us a year and, and kind of pushed us uh, a little bit. And, and I would agree with Bruce. I think there's a lot of community involvement and um, education that needs to happen with our community with this. Uh, I think, you know, creating some level of sense of urgency, I think is going to be important uh, as we continue to continue to look at this. But um it was interesting because we thought, you know, maybe option A would be one that we'd want to at least check. But, uh, you know, according to members of the community, uh, the committee, I mean, really nobody wanted option A. And I think the biggest reason was it was a lot of money still. And when he got done, it was like, uh, I don't really have much to show for it. I mean, and whereas option B, at least uh, you, even if you kept all of the buildings, you at least had something that you know you could see what your money was invested in so um and then i think when we talked through c and d those really had conversations about it you know if if you were going to have to consolidate buildings or lose a building at least if you were going to a brand new school um you know you have that to look forward to versus 
trying to go to a remodeled school that maybe still not going to fit quite right. Um, and people say, well, you remodeled the high school. I can't remodel the elementary. So the biggest thing is the way the high school was built lent itself well to what we did with it. It was a giant cast in place concrete structure. So you just have to remember though, it was, we tried, I think the district tried before I got here to do something in another location. And people said, Nope, we want it at that location, that spot. And so, um, that based on what the community feedback we got, that's why we did what we did at the high school. And I think that's why it'll be important to survey the community um, on the elementary situation as well. Well, at elementary, we could put a question, the survey about the middle school and whether the community is ready to hear about those needs and want to, you know, see, see where that's at. Um, we have it. And actually in the survey that we're starting to draft, we have the middle school actually broken out as a totally separate question I think that's smart. You know, so people can look at okay here's option one elementary here's option two with the elementary and then here's you know give us your feedback on the the middle school portion is kind of how we kind of have how we have it broken out um, and, and you know on this um, powerpoint you know the operations page was blank because i know it's a work in progress hard to nail down all those operational savings you know, to the penny, like Tim can do with so many other things in our when it comes to finances in this district. But still, even if you took a midpoint of that range of 1.5 million to something over 2 million annually, let's take the 1.75 and then you extrapolate it out over the 20 years that we'll be buying the bonds and financing this, that's $35 million. In essence, you're getting option E, you're getting one whole new school for no tax impact to net tax impact to the taxpayers because uh, you're getting it back in operational savings over that time. So um, that is something that I hope the community is going to understand. It's going to, you know, take some time, like a lot of educational meetings, to do that. But anyway, Bob, do you have something? Uh, I just mentioned that one of the things that was impressive about the committee that I committee work that I witnessed was their understanding of looking at long-term situation, you know, 20 year solution versus just, you know, cause you're right. Whoever mentioned that, yeah, the, the buildings look fine. There's paint on the walls. They're, I mean, there's not stained ceiling tiles. It's, it's maintained, um, but are they efficient? And do we want to invest in properties that still will be problematic in the future? And, um, you know, you know, some things that come to light are, you know, well, Willow is a, a school that is, you know, allows a lot of walking. Well, not really. There's a lot of people bus to Willow because of the Willow River and, and the, the geographic limitations. And a lot of that, a lot of those things are coming out. And I think when people take a look at that, they'll start to, to see that um, we'd rather put money into a long-term solution than put more money into a potential shorter term solution and then we're stuck with buildings that we have to address later uh and, and so basically money not money not going to programming going to inefficient buildings yeah and i think you know one of the questions asked what percentage of our kids you know when people talk about neighbor at school so just to give you an idea 92 percent of the kids at holton are eligible for transportation um north hudson 51 percent. so that means they live more than a mile essentially from the school or they you know, wouldn't be considered a safe route to school based on what kind of traffic they'd have to cross. Willow River, 65% of the kids that go to Willow River are eligible for transportation. A lot of people think of Willow as just being a downtown school. And actually that boundary goes all the way out to east of the town of Hudson. Um, and so it's not just downtown. EP Rock, even though it sits like right in the middle of a neighborhood, it's 70% of its boundary uh, sits, uh, is eligible for busing. If you think about that, we have, uh, if you think of the Red Cedar Canyon area, which is actually south of the interstate, that's all, that all goes to EP Rock Elementary School. Um, Rivercrest, 87% of Rivercrest uh, students are eligible for transportation. And Hudson Prairie, 85% of the students at Hudson Prairie are eligible for transportation. And so um, it is probably a little bit misleading to say that we have neighborhood schools in, from the standpoint of, of if you think about a large quantities of our our students walking to school we definitely do have some that do walk to school but it is not the it would not be the norm if you've ever had to either a pick up your child before or after school uh you see the number of buses that are there or b you see the number of cars that you're having to deal with as other parents are dropping their kids off at school or picking them up um 
when you get into the middle school and high school, 95% of our kids qualify for busing uh, to the middle school. So, you know, it's, it's a, you know, as we start to look at this, it really is about how do we operate in a more efficient manner long-term. Um, and uh, it, we just, we don't have those walking schools like everybody, I think kind of in their mind might think that we do, but this was a piece of information that somebody had asked for. And so we pulled this today and uh, it kind of shocked me a little bit. I mean, we have a lot of people that are eligible for busing. And that would mean, like I said, it's more than a mile uh, and, uh, or there's not a safe route uh, to, to that, to that building. So like having to cross the interstate would be considered unreasonable you, you, to have a kindergarten across wanting, yeah. the reason. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. Any other questions on this or comments? Um, I would, all right. Yeah. Jay, I, I guess I would just echo, um, this is going to be a communications challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, Cause it's a lot to get your arms around, you know, even one thing that we haven't talked about and that really um, stuck with me from that meeting last Monday was, was the replacement value numbers, mm -hmm. you know, and to look at with option B as an example, what's proposed at EP Rock, which is a little bit of new space, but kind of to your point about not a lot mm -hmm. will look different. And that's 90, the cost of that is 94% of the replacement value for that school, which, you know, when you look at the smart money question, it just, wow, that, that I mean, that's hard, but then you balance that with, and I get it, people have a very nostalgic attachment to the existing building. I mean, there are memories there. We've got families who are parents who their kids are now attending the school they attend. I mean, so I, I totally understand. And I think we need to create room for that conversation about what's the value of that piece because there's value um but i do think that i'm looking across the room at tracy um the the i mean the communication piece here is just going to be really challenging how do you take all of these complex bits and and put them together in a bite-sized piece that that people will will read and um and and be able to make sense of and then hopefully make an informed decision based on their own are, are we allowed to mandate that voters attend a 90 minute meeting on this before <laughs> they vote only people that attend the meeting can, can vote, vote. yeah that's it's not how it works but it is and that's all the more reason why to get to get the uh, you know the direction knocked down or you know nailed down is so that we know what exactly it is that we are communicating out to people so they know what they're voting on. I mean, our goal is to make sure we're as transparent as possible. Uh, if people say, Hey, we really want a, or we really want B or E, um, you know, we're, we're putting the facts out there. Um, some people will say, boy, it looks like you really lean this way or that way. Well, I, the, the facts lean a certain direction. And um, when you start to have a lot of facts stack up in one direction, it does start to um, become a challenge to, keep an open mind to some of the other options. So, all right, well, you'll, um, so if you're at the the last meeting, it is at Hudson Prairie and the middle school this next Monday, right, Tim? Right, six o'clock, we'll start at, uh, <clears throat> at the middle school, do a tour and then do a short tour of Prairie as well. Mm -hmm. And well, and then the meeting will commence at Prairie, is that where it's gonna be? At Prairie, yep. correct, 6.30. So just to give you a kind of an idea, and then uh, like I said, our, our goal is to hopefully you know, have survey out and dropped in mailboxes by December 1st so we can get feedback. We do know that we get probably about 90% of the survey responses come back and they're usually in the first couple of days. When you say, Tracy, it's been our experience. There, there's not a lot of uh, um, people that are waiting the full two weeks to to do the survey. So so when you say the meetings at Prairie after the tours, is that the cafeteria or the media center or? Yeah. Um, I think we've got this set up for the media center, okay. but we'll check. We'll, we'll send out a reminder on Friday and one on Monday as well. Very good. Right. Anything else on that? Otherwise, moving on to um, our final agenda, action agenda item is the adult meal pricing change. Yep. So this is, this is a little, this is unusual, um, but because we're participating in what's called the summer, the su seamless summer option program. And that's the one that allows uh, all kids to eat uh, meals for free. Um, we're reimbursed by the by the USDA through uh, DPI. And so uh, mid mid October, DPI informed us that uh, informed all districts across the state that uh, you need to look at your adult meal prices because of the reimbursement rates that have gone up uh, through the SSO program since last year. So um, under that requirement, adult 
breakfast would move from two dollars and thirty cents to two fifty six, and lunch would move from three ninety to four to four sixty five. And this is a requirement of the USDA. But since you normally approve lunch pricing, um, we brought it back to you uh, just as more of, of an FYI than anything else. But uh, we do need to move that. And so uh, we did institute that price increase. So uh, who does this 1st. affect like staff? It, it affects, yeah, only if you're, if you're a, an adult eating a meal. So yeah, mainly staff. Move to approve. There's been a motion, a second to approve. Any further discussion or questions of Tim? Everyone had this in their packet, so I'm not seeing anybody raising their hand, needing to ask a bunch of questions. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Motion passes. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. We are adjourned. <laughs>